Good morning. So I'm Drew Thompson. I'm a visiting senior research fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I'd like to thank everybody for joining our webinar this morning. Um, by way of background, the Center for Asian Globalization is a research center at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. Uh, we conduct in-depth research on developments in the Asia Pacific and beyond, and we aim to provide academics, decision makers, and the general public with objective analysis on issues of regional and global significance. Counterpoint Southeast Asia is a new webinar and policy brief series, which is produced by the Center on Asian Globalization that tackles strategic and complex questions facing Southeast Asia by presenting the perspectives of regional academics and policy experts. This is our fourth webinar, and there's a link below to our previous episodes and briefs, and there'll be another CounterPoint episode coming up in November, so stay tuned. But before we start, I'd like to remind everybody in the audience that we welcome your questions during this webinar. Please use the Q&A function below, uh, and I ask that you also identify yourself with your full name and your affiliation if you have one, and please also make your question direct and to the point, and I will incorporate it into the conversation. So we're gonna discuss how Southeast Asia um, might have to deal with contingencies surrounding the cross-strait relationship. And as everyone knows, uh, the speaker of the US House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan in early August, followed by China's military displays immediately afterwards, really brought global attention to cross-strait tensions. Ballistic missile launches, successive waves of aircraft sorties flown into and around uh, Taiwan, uh, into their ADIs and around Taiwan, across the Taiwan Strait centerline, as well as the declaration of six military exclusion zones encircling Taiwan all underscored the volatility of the situation. And for many in Southeast Asia, the invasion of Ukraine in February also demonstrated that a military invasion could potentially be used to settle political disputes elsewhere in the world. In August, Military exercises revealed for many the reality that a conflict over Taiwan would not be geographically constrained to the island and the strait that separates it from the mainland. China's military exercises proved that a conflict over Taiwan would inevitably encompass neighboring states, both north and south of Taiwan. The addition to of ballistic missiles launched from China, flying over Taiwan before landing in Japan's EEZ, and also one of the military exclusion zones declared by China was in the Bashi Channel, separating Taiwan from the Philippines. And the extent of that military exclusion zone was only 10 nautical miles from the Philippines' territorial waters. So there's little remaining doubt that the cross-strait conflict would not only affect the economic and political interests of Southeast Asian states, it would create a security challenge as well. So we're joined by three experts representing three Southeast Asian countries which each have vital interests in preserving cross-strait stability. Our first is Professor Ian Chong, who's an Associate Professor of Political Science at the National University of Singapore. His work covers US-China relations, security and order in Northeast and Southeast Asia. He covers coercive diplomacy, foreign interference, cross-strait relations, and Taiwan politics. He'd previously worked at CSIS in Washington, DC, as well as at the Institute of Defense and Strategic Studies. And he also worked at the East Asian Institute in Singapore. Rati Kabinawa is a PhD candidate of international relations and Asian studies at the University of Western Australia. She works on a research project entitled Engaging Non-State Actors, the Transnational Politics of Taiwan's Foreign Policy in Southeast Asia. And lastly, we're joined by Ivy Kwek. She's a fellow for China at the International Crisis Group. She monitors and conducts research on China's foreign policy and its role in conflict prevention and resolution in the region. Prior to that, she was a visiting scholar at the National Zhengzhou University in Taiwan, and she served as a special functions officer to the deputy minister at the Ministry of Defense in Malaysia. She's also had vast experience working in policy advisory and government affairs roles in think tanks and international organizations. So with that, let me get to the discussion. And I will pose the first question to Ian, followed by questions to Rati and Ivy. So Ian, Singapore's links to Taiwan are quite deep, including social, economic, and security ties. And Singapore has a very vested interest in preserving the current status quo, but Singaporeans seem to be very detached about the coercive pressure that Taiwan is under. 
and they're unconcerned about the potential scale and scope of the impact, uh, both on Singapore's interests and even within Singapore itself, should a cross-strait military conflict occur. So my question to you is, what are the underlying causes of that inattention, and what conditions would need to change to affect Singapore's approach? Was Pelosi's visit uh, uh, and the ballistic missiles being fired into neighboring countries uh, a wake-up call? Or do you think that uh, Singaporeans will continue to be relatively apathetic about uh, the situation? Thanks, Drew. Um, thanks for starting us off. Uh, let me just start by saying that uh, my comments are my own, so there's no confusion about that. I represent only myself. So I think for many Singaporeans, the fact, despite the fact that there are very significant economic, uh, social, and um, other ties be between um, Taiwan uh, and, and our country, uh, there's generally a lot of inattention, right, as, as Drew has pointed out. Um, and I think part of it is a perhaps lack of attention, lack of uh, understanding um, about the nature of our relationship. Taiwan, I think, is Singapore's uh, fourth or fifth largest trading partner. There are deep investment ties, so there are clear sort of economic uh, relations. But um, a lot of the attention focuses on either firstly the big trading relationship with China or else uh, the investment relationship with, with the US. So other countries, uh, include, including uh, um, Japan and others, will, will sort of fall off. So there's an attention there. Um, secondly, I, um, I think for many Singaporeans, the idea of Taiwan is sort of far away. They don't seem to see Taiwan as uh, tied to, to the region necessarily, right? Um, so any tensions, um, any issues that come might come up with Taiwan security are seen to be someone else's problems. Um, this ignores the fact that um, for uh, any Taiwan contingency, uh, that would affect shipping and, um, and air routes. It would potentially draw in uh, a US, uh, potentially draw in US participation, maybe Australia as well. And these, both the US and Australia are uh, countries with you know, close sec uh, security and military ties with Singapore. So that could involve Singapore um, getting involved in transit and access issues. Now, um, that of course, the implication of that is China, I think in a big enough contingency would want to complicate those uh, calculations. And so could potentially decide that they want to put pressure on the Singapore government or maybe activate um, some of the underlying sentiment, uh, anti-Western sentiment, anti-US sentiment uh, in, in, uh, in Singapore or perhaps to trigger um, a lot of uh, some degree of confusion. So what this would mean then is that Singapore could get drawn in quite quickly into uh, a, a Taiwan um, uh, contingency. Now, for the longest time, to get to Drew's question, the view is that um, not only is Taiwan far away, it's a China-Taiwan problem, it's a big power problem, uh, and Singapore should just lie low. Uh, and hope that things will pass us by. Uh, that's never been the case, uh, and I doubt it will be the case going forward. And perhaps the probability of Singapore being able to sit this out will, will decrease. Even if Singapore doesn't want to do anything, uh, pressure could come quite easily and quickly from both Washington and Beijing. Um, and I think uh, Singaporeans would do well to remind themselves of this and think about how they want to respond to it. Um, the previous view as well, that, well, things will get talked out, um, that some arrangement will get sorted out. Singapore might have some early warning. I think that might have been true when Singapore had more direct uh, direct and closer ties between particular leaders. Um, that era has passed, so I don't think we can rely on uh, that. So let me just start there and, and pass it on. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Let me turn to, to, to Rati and ask about Indonesia. So Indonesia's approach to a Taiwan conflict, as, you, as you've explained it, uh, is, is much like other Southeast Asian states. It emphasizes neutrality uh, and the protection of its interests, uh, including protecting the more than 200,000 Indonesian citizens who live in Taiwan currently. Um, and you also note that creating an anti-access military capability to prevent belligerents from accessing Indonesia's uh, air and sea space uh, is, is another key objective for uh, for Indonesia. But it, it, in, from my perspective, these are explicitly defensive responses to a conflict on Indonesia's periphery. So my question to you is, is there anything that Indonesia might do in advance of a conflict to prevent it? 
or do Indonesian assessments conclude that a cross-strait conflict is, is either inevitable or impossible um, and therefore simply not preventable? Okay, um, thanks Drew for a short introduction and having us in this webinar. Actually having this webinar is actually one way for us Southeast Asian to discuss and raise awareness of Taiwan's issue that seems far from our region, but the impact will be massive, especially with the potential of armed conflict in the future. Um, in responding to your questions, yes, I, as I mentioned in my paper that I identified Indonesia three core interests based on the conflict scenario that might occur in the future. However, I didn't touch upon the issue of conflict prevention because I believe not much that Indonesia can do to prevent the conflict. Um, first, Indonesia and other ASEAN member countries do not have a clear roadmap for crisis management and conflict prevention in the region. This country would take an action in responding to the conflict instead of taking preventive action. Um, second, it is a good initiative that ASEAN countries issued collective and individual statement during China's military drills in August, urging all parties to practice restraint. Um, further, uh, furthermore, during the 77 UNGA session, Indonesia also proposed uh, three new paradigms of win-win, not zero-sum, the paradigms of engagement, not of containment, and the paradigms of collaboration, not of competition. This was a great initiative coming from Indonesia and ASEAN member countries. However, I haven't seen how these three paradigms and ASEAN-led mechanism would be, manifest, would be manifested or utilized to prevent conflict or facilitate peaceful dialogue. As we can see now, the region itself um, is facing um, regional conflict inside them from the Myanmar crisis. And we haven't fully recovered from COVID, uh, COVID issue as well. Perhaps we could expect some preventive actions or at least um, expect Indonesia to maintain a status quo from its leadership as the host of G20 and chairman of the ASEAN or presidency of ASEAN next year. Indonesia might facilitate dialogue between the US and China during the G20 meeting discussing the Taiwan issue. However, from my point of view, this wouldn't be too effective as Taiwan is left out of the meeting. Taiwan is not invited to the G20 meeting. Um, and from my point of view as well, the future of cross-trade relation will mostly depend on the US, China, and most importantly, Taiwan itself in solving the disputes. What other countries can do is prepare themselves for a contingency plan should the tension deteriorate. And from my point of view as well, the one China policy itself is already a zero sum, not a win-win solution because every time we, we try, every time many countries try, uh, uh, try to bring Taiwan's issue into the table, then China will reject it, okay? And um, uh, we can also have a look at Indonesia diplomacy to mitigate the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. The um, coefficient to Ukraine and Russia was ineffective in preventing Russia further invasion of Ukraine because the visit was mostly aimed at fulfilling Indonesia domestic interests. So in terms of you know, mitigating conflict or being an honest broker between US, Taiwan, or China, it, Indonesia does at least not yet having that capability in doing that sort of uh, honest broker role. And also during the UNGA session among ASEAN member countries, the Philippines was the only country in the region that acknowledged the pressing dilemma that would occur on the cross-strait crisis. I think acknowledgement of the issue is the first step a country should do before deciding on next step or next option that they will take. But we don't see this sort of um, uh, acknowledgement from uh, ASEAN, other ASEAN member countries uh, in uh, uh, agreeing that, okay, this is a pressing issue, we should take an action. I didn't see that so far. Well, well I hope to see that in the future before the conflict uh, escalating into, a, uh, before the crisis escalating into a conflict or an armed conflict. I think that's it from me um, at the moment now. And yeah, happy to take more questions later.
Rati, thank you. That was very, very, very thought provoking. Um, let me turn to Ivy. So your essay gives me the sense that Malaysia would prioritize ASEAN as an organization that could take a, a leading role in preventing cross-strait conflict uh, rather than Malaysia leading itself. Um, and you also suggested that by playing the role of potentially a, a go-between might enable ASEAN to, to reclaim uh, its centrality. Now, knowing, uh, of course, full well ASEAN's limitations and the considerable influence uh, among some ASEAN states uh, that China has that are, are less geographically, economically, or socially exposed to a cross-strait conflict, how might Malaysia protect its own interests or effectively prod ASEAN to take measures to prevent a conflict. As Rati just pointed out, um, you know, ASEAN doesn't really have a great sense of urgency um, about a cross-strait uh, crisis. So I think lastly, I'd ask, you know, how much do you think would depend upon which country chairs uh, ASEAN that year uh, when a conflict potentially emerges? Because the, the character of ASEAN changes year to year uh, with the chairmanship. So how much would that affect ASEAN's effectiveness in the event of a cross-strait crisis? Okay, thank you, Drew, for your question and uh, introduction. And uh, thank you very much to the Kuan Yew School of Public Policy for inviting me to this panel. Uh, before I answer your question, uh, I would like to just start by saying that I agree with uh, my previous two speakers that I think there is a lack of awareness on how a Taiwan conflict might affect uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and I'm glad that we're having this webinar, uh, which I think will give us the opportunity to uh, discuss more. Uh, I, I am, however, a bit uh, more optimistic than Rati in terms of what I think uh, ASEAN can do as a bloc, as well as what the, the kind of uh, impact that Malaysia might uh, have. Uh, I think that we are not being, we are not being, uh, uh, we, we are not saying that uh, ASEAN is uh, going to actually affect a, a very major change, but I think uh, the involvement of ASEAN uh, lending its voice into this conflict will definitely have uh, some impact uh, in terms of uh, preventing a conflict uh, erupting in, uh, over the Taiwan Straits. Um, I think at the moment there's generally three, uh, sorry, uh, a few mainstream views uh, that I observe uh, in Malaysia and also in general in Malaysia, sorry, in Southeast Asia that I think we should uh, challenge and maybe uh, correct. Uh, number one, it is that uh, Southeast Asia core interests might not be uh, so severely affected by a uh, Taiwan Strait conflict. Uh, to warrant any actions that might actually uh, risk jeopardizing our relations with China. And then I think there's a second view that's, that actually thinks that uh, if a war is to break out, there's not much that uh, Southeast Asia can do anyway. Uh, I would argue that uh, the implications uh, would be huge enough to warrant a more proactive response. And I think Drew has uh, made a good case in the introduction just now on why we should care uh, and uh, look at this uh, issue uh, more seriously. Uh, in my paper, I have also outlined some of the uh, more specific uh, challenge to Malaysia's interest, uh, including uh, our interest in South China Sea, the impact on our economy, uh, as well as this geopolitical dilemma that we might find ourselves in where we would be perhaps uh, forced to choose sides between US and China. And last but, last but not least, the safety of our citizens in Taiwan as well as the surrounding, re surrounding uh, region in Japan and southern part of China. Um, and I think that uh, to the point about risking our uh, relations uh, with China, I think that that is a misconception that we should challenge, that uh, Southeast Asia voicing out about their concerns uh, over the peace and stability of Taiwan Straits it should not be interpreted as a violation of the one China policy uh, that uh, Southeast Asia countries adhere to, nor should it be construed as uh, taking sides uh, between US and China. Uh, I think it's important that uh, Southeast Asia and Malaysia uh, should uh, establish why 
they have a stake in these uh, issues and therefore their voice matters. Uh, and then I think for the second point about uh, whether there is anything that Southeast Asia can uh, do, uh, I mean, firstly, I think uh, conflict over Taiwan is not inevitable. Uh, and uh, as I think we, we mentioned just now, even though Southeast Asia is not a main actor, uh, it does have uh, some uh, impact on the outcome. Um, I think that uh, ASEAN do have a comparative advantage in that it is a uh, acceptable choice for both US and China. Uh, both uh, US and China respect or at least uh, pay lip service to the ASEAN centrality. Uh, interestingly, uh, China has uh, just published a position paper in August uh, where it uh, actually it reiterated its uh, it's a recognition of ASEAN centrality. And it's, uh, it, it, uh, the wording is also quite clear. It says that China will unservingly take ASEAN as a high priority in its uh, neighborhood diplomacy. Um, I think that uh, ASEAN will be able to make China feel that it is on a friendly turf. Uh, there are perhaps some wordings that Ch uh, ASEAN can uh, issue that can acknowledge some of uh, China's concern, but also at the same time, there is a that there is a way for ASEAN to also uh, uh, seek assurance uh, from China uh, about uh, uh, restraint uh, on its behavior. Uh, likewise, I think that US will be will also be happy to see uh, the Taiwan Straits issue being discussed as at the regional level. And uh, I think in return, ASEAN can also uh, ask for more US resources to be put in this region and also use this as an opportunity to uh, strengthen defense uh, ties with the US and other partners. Um, as to whether Malaysia should prioritize ASEAN, uh, I think the answer is yes. Uh, obviously, Malaysia should also uh, pursue other bi bilateral channels, uh, but uh, a united ASEAN voice will definitely carry more weight. Uh, and I think that by doing that, not only we can uh, project strength uh, in numbers, but we can also actually distribute the risk of uh, any individual country being singled out or targeted for speaking out. Uh, so, uh, and in terms of your second last uh, section of your questions about how to prod ASEAN to do more, I'm afraid I don't really have a perfect answer, <laughs> but I think that we all know that uh, it, agendas uh, in ASEAN are always driven by uh, certain individual member states. And it's usually through uh, a lot of uh, lobbying efforts, uh, negotiations and seeking compromises between ASEAN uh, states that we finally reach a consensus. Uh, but it, the, the, it always has to start with uh, a one or two or a few uh, member states. And the, to your point about how different member states might have a different comfort level in terms of speaking out, I think that's, uh, that's uh, well uh, taken, that's point well taken. Uh, but I think that's all the more reason why uh, Maritime Southeast Asia should uh, take the lead in, uh, in uh, using ASEAN as a channel in uh, helping ASEAN to uh, have a common statement as a block. Uh, finally, about uh, ASEAN chair, uh, yes, it will definitely uh, re uh, depend a lot on who is the ASEAN chair of the year. Uh, we don't really know when the conflict might uh, will break out if it were to break out. <laughs> um, obviously, you know, most of the educated guesses say uh, maybe 2027 is a dangerous uh turning point, or it could be 2049, we don't know. <laughs> um, but I think the point is that uh, ASEAN should start showing early int uh, interest early and actually de develop its uh, normative power uh, over this matter. So um, I will stop there and I would like to hear more from my fellow panel as well as the, yeah, Drew. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I, I think we can all agree that ASEAN is perfectly imperfect. Um, uh, but it's definitely a factor. Let, let me 
we're going to keep this conversational. So, so not everybody has to answer every question. So uh, let me direct a question back at Ivy. You, you said something uh, I found rather um, fascinating. Uh, you, you, you essentially implied that that increasing defense cooperation between Malaysia and potentially other countries multilaterally would explicitly be towards improving their ability to address a Taiwan contingency. And, and I would think that today, if that were to happen, um, if, if a multilateral group or five power defense agreement were to, to start addressing Taiwan explicitly in, 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 their, in their planning, uh, that might be very provocative, might be very politically difficult. So my question for you would be maybe what conditions would need to change for it to become more, say, acceptable for Malaysia you know, and other countries to expand their security cooperation specifically towards mitigating the consequences of a Taiwan conflict? Uh, or how, how might that be designed in such a way to make it politically palatable to uh, both Malaysia and potentially other other states. Mm. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I think that there there is uh, that that there is the there is the there is uh, the matter of uh, actually um, uh, do, doing things and uh, announcing it and making it uh, something that is. Uh, uh, very publicly known, and there's also things that uh, that I think uh, different countries should do uh, in preparing and to to uh, you know to to for for our own uh, self interest. Uh, I think there are there are preparations that we should uh, be doing in to increase our readiness. So I think in that sense. Uh, uh, there is not much of a controversy uh, if we were to uh, say that we want to uh, prepare for a contingency because exactly because it will uh, affect our interest in such and such a way. So I think that uh, drawing the line between how uh, uh, a contingency scenario might affect our interest is uh, quite important, and I think that has to happen first. The that that kind of uh, the kind of a uh, paradigm shift, maybe uh, the kind of uh, I I don't know how much uh, this has really been taken into consideration by the policy makers. Uh, perhaps uh, in private there has been more discussion that has uh, uh, that is going on than uh, what is uh, publicly known, uh, and I certainly hope that that is the case. Um, but uh, I think that making that linkage is definitely the first step in saying that uh, why we should be preparing and uh, why it is not a provocative act towards anybody, but really for our self-interest. And I think the point that you said about how uh, close uh, Chinese uh, military exercise have come to our doorsteps. Uh, essentially, uh, Bashi Channel is only 10 nautical miles, and it is sort of the bottleneck, right, uh, that would and, uh, to South China Sea. So I think that we definitely have a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, we, there's definitely a lot of reason for us to be prepared, yeah. Thank you, that's a great response. So we've got a number of questions coming in online, but I'd like to pose one more question to all three panelists. Um, and this is something that Ian alluded to at, at the outset uh, in, in, in his presentation about the, the cultural dynamic uh, uh, with uh, the ethnic Chinese population in Singapore. Since all three countries represented here in the panel, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, have pretty sizable ethnic Chinese populations, and, and, and racial tensions are certainly never far below the surface. So my, my question to pose to each of you is, is how might cross-strait relations exacerbate domestic tensions and domestic problems in each country? Uh, what are possible catalysts for increasing those tensions or unrest? Um, and in each country, how might the ethnic Chinese community play into decision-making at the higher levels, at the, at the national level? Or how might it affect strategy development in advance of a of, of a conflict. Uh, maybe start with Ian and then um, uh, go to Rati and then Ivy. All right, sure. So um, I have to preface this by saying that um, for 
places um, like Singapore, but also in Southeast Asia too, um, the ethnic Chinese communities have historically been uh, the sub subject have been subject to the targets and been the targets of uh, mobilization efforts from um, coming from China, whether this had to do with the uh, Qing government, whether this had to do with the Revolutionary Alliance that became the KMT, later the KMT, and also during the Cold War, the KMT uh, CCP contestation. So this is not new. Um, what is new is the um, post-independence nation building efforts, which uh, various countries, including Singapore, have embarked on. Um, this has been the, these efforts have tried to emphasize some sense of national identity and local rootedness. However, the long shadow of this uh, relationship with political entities in China continues to hang over um, a lot of these communities. The, a lot of the appeal that the PRC is trying to make now is um, toward this sort of cultural, but a sort of fusion of this sort of cultural and the political, that if you are culturally, um, ethnically Chinese, you need to take positions that are aligned with that of the PRC. Um, that actually is pretty longstanding, but you can see um, how the efforts to sort of um, activate these sorts of sentiments can push up against um, the, the sort of local efforts at nation building. And these are things that Rati and uh, Ivy can speak to, to their own countries, but um, in the past, these have uh, created a lot of tension. Um, even as recently as COVID, we see how some of these ethnic interesting differences in Singapore um, showed up in terms of some of the, some of the more racist behaviors that, that we see here. So any um, uh, major Taiwan Street um, contingency, I can see uh, if it's important enough to Beijing, they will try to pull out all the stops to complicate decision-making in this region. And this can very easily transfer um, into um, some of the pre-existing uh, tensions uh, among uh, the local communities. I mean, we saw this a little bit during the uh, Ukraine, um, the start of the Ukraine war, where uh, what looked like uh, PRC related affiliated efforts to move public sentiment uh, that I think is also pretty uh, persis persistent in the region um, has had led to some tensions. We can expect those to become more intense, right, in the effect, uh, in the event of a, a Taiwan Strait uh, conflict. And I think also the, the point that I want to also stress is um, we probably, to pick off what I was saying, I mean, I think we need to think about preparation and mitigation, but also what to do in the event of a uh, contingency. And part of this also is to understand uh, where we stand in terms of the one China policy, one China principle. Uh, I think there's a lot of confusion and that's the sort of confusion that I think has been sort of played upon. Each country has their one China policies which govern their relation, official relations with Beijing. Now, a lot of this will involve not formally recognizing Taiwan, but that's very different from Beijing's One China Principle, which claims that Taiwan is a part of China that is defined uh, by the PRC. And as uh, engagement goes on, uh, of course, the PRC is trying to blur those lines, but for our own sort of national considerations, it's important to recognize where our own policy stands. Those policies can change over time, of course, but um, to make that distinction clear uh, among the ethnic Chinese communities, I think is quite key. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Rati, do you have some thoughts? Yeah, um, in regards to the ethnic Chinese community in Indonesia itself, I think um, this is a sort of general knowledge that um, ethnic Chinese uh, community in Southeast Asia were divided into pro Taipei and pro Beijing um, uh, in, in their political stand that they are divided into pro Taipei and pro Beijing. Those are pro Taipei are mostly uh, former Chaosheng who studied in Taiwan in the 1960s to the 1970s. And they set up a sort of um, Taiwan Alumni Association and that's and that association were actually funded by the, supported and funded by the uh, Overseas Chinese Affairs Commission in, tai, in Taipei. So this sort of um, um, influence from Taipei was also quite strong, but those associations are maintaining or those this ethnic Chinese community who are pro-Taipei were actually maintaining a very low profile because of the sensitivity of the issues and also about their association and stuff. I think uh, in Malaysia, let's say, I think if we could later on elaborate more that uh, Malaysia um, has uh, the largest ethnic Chinese populations um, in terms of uh, that has connection with Taiwan. The second was Indonesia and the third continue with Singapore, um, maintaining that sort of stable connection and this um, ethnic Chinese communities um, 
also linked to the Taiwanese business people. So in terms of uh, when we talk about the catalyst, uh, the role of uh, the catalyst of the region, uh, there were already um, some research published on the role of Taiwan or Taiwanese business people, especially between cross-strait relations, China and Taiwan. Um, in mitigating the conflict uh, between between China and Taiwan, uh, whether Taishan could be a hostage or buffer or lobbying group for the relation. And maybe we can delve into this um, sort of relations as well in Southeast Asia on how the Taiwan, uh, the, the presence of Taiwan's business association in Southeast Asia that maintain a close link with the local ethnic Chinese might also play a role in uh, mitigating the conflict uh, between the um, uh, between between the two sides, uh, Southeast Asia and the cross trade relations. Um, in terms of how, in responding to your questions about the impact of the crisis toward the domestic politics for the Indonesia itself, um, it is very clear that the um, the issue of migrant workers would be the main um, issue that uh, would trigger domestic politics because you know that these migrant workers um, in Indonesia and uh, these Indonesian migrant workers in Taiwan, they also established a um, network of advocacy with many CSO in Indonesia, um, civil society organization or non-governmental organization in Indonesia, and they got support from the um, House of Representatives in Indonesia as well. So that might actually um, trigger a uh, domestic politics um, issue in Indonesia. And usually, um, uh, we, because we are approaching our election within two years, and usually uh, migrant workers is a floating mass that uh, migrant workers overseas in Malaysia and Taiwan, particularly, become a floating <laughs> mass for, uh, for votes. Uh, popular vote for this candidate, so it might actually involve sort of um, a political issue as well here on which candidate that would actually uh, would like to use this issue to uh, win the election and stuff like that. So that might be a, a future in the future uh, a future of a view of the conflict towards the, the impact of the conflict towards domestic politics. Yeah, I think that's for me. Thank you, Rati. That was that was interesting. Ivy, before I turn to you, I want to build on that overarching question about uh, about uh, relations between the Chinese ethnic community and 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 the Bumiputra. Is is a question that we got online from Jason Ng, um, who's asking essentially is is why Malaysians are uh, indifferent to the issue surrounding Taiwan, and he's asking is it because of uh, domestic issues being more 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 primary, whether it's elections or floods or, or the economy. Um, and then his, his other follow-up question is, are Chinese Malays of the opinion that Taiwan should return to China um, or, or not? So, so he, he'd appreciate your uh, opinion on that as well. Um, okay, thank you so much for the question. Uh, um, so I think as we all know, Malaysian politics is a very racialized one. And uh, it has been going, go, undergoing a lot of um, uh, uncertainties in recent years. Um, so I think that there is definitely a danger that uh, this uh, Taiwan issue is being seen from a racial lens. And I think that is uh, something that we should uh, should not uh, should uh, prevent from happening. Uh, it is uh, important to stress that uh, the Taiwan Straits crisis is not a Chinese problem. Uh, obviously, the Chinese, the China Chinese narrative is, uh, you know, obviously that this is, this is the 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 historical uh, uh, mission of the Chinese people, and this narrative might uh, sell among some. Um, Malaysian Chinese, and I think that there's definitely a pro-Beijing camp uh, among the Chinese community, uh, particularly among the business community. Uh, but I also tend to think that this is not representative of uh, all Chinese, Malaysian Chinese people. I think that uh, Malaysian Chinese uh, have, perhaps there are uh, at a certain level, felt that uh, a, uh, a rising China, it is, is a, a proof of, uh, you know, perhaps that it's, it's a pride for, 
for, for, for Chinese. And that is a very complicated sentiment because of uh, perhaps some of the domestic politics that is happening in Malaysia where uh, Malaysian Chinese might felt that they are being uh, uh, treated as a secondary citizens uh, and etc. So I think that is a very complicated sentiment that sort of get uh, get entwined into this whole uh, issue about whether Taiwan, uh, this whole issue of Taiwan and China. Um, so I think that it is important for us to stress that this is not uh, so much of a uh, race problem and uh, we should be able to see Taiwan Straits problem uh, more from a security perspective uh, and not so much about whether uh, this is something that we should support because uh, we are Chinese. And I think that is a reflection that uh, Malaysian Chinese should uh, should have as uh, should should have among themselves as well. Uh, and also, I think that the 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 idea that uh, Taiwan the Taiwanese population is also increasingly. Uh, having a very strong Taiwanese identity. And I think that is very clear if you look at the polls that are being conducted uh, in uh, some of the university in Taiwan now, where uh, I think that a, a vast majority of people do not identify as uh, Chinese, but uh, as Taiwanese. So I think that is also, uh, maybe a point that uh, we should ponder because I think as a Malaysian Chinese, uh, there is also a distinct identity that we have uh, uh, as a Malaysian of uh, Chinese origin uh, uh, as contrast to uh, being a Chinese, uh, yeah, as per the China's uh, interpretation. Great, thank you. Let me let me change change tack here to another topic. Uh, again, prompted by a question online from Roger Huang at uh, Macquarie University in Australia. Uh, he's asking a question essentially that's been touched on in, in a couple points already about the role of intermediaries. Um, we, we've 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 mentioned the the Taishang, the the Taiwan business people as a potential intermediary. I think there's uh, frequently questions asked about whether ASEAN. I think um, Ivy, you raised that in your paper about whether or not ASEAN could act as an intermediary, or whether an individual state such as Singapore could um, could somehow facilitate discussions. So maybe if I could get each of you to give me. Um, your sense of whether or not either you know your individual country or ASEAN you think would make an effective uh, an, an effective intermediary uh, between I think you'd have to look at the U.S. China dyad you'd have to look at maybe the Taiwan China dyad as well the cross strait relationship you know is it is an intermediary needed or necessary there that's certainly something that the U.S. has always staunchly avoided. Uh, taking that role, and that's part of the U.S. six assurances. But is, is that is that something that that ASEAN countries might lean towards? Um, uh, and again, I think for for Ian, uh, maybe you might also highlight the uh, you know as 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 much as you can, sort of how from Singapore's perspective, the relationship and the security relationship that that Singapore has managed to maintain with Taiwan since. Um, uh, since recognizing uh, China, uh, how that might factor into uh, Singapore's role, should we say, in between the, the two uh, cross-strait uh, players. So maybe we'll go reverse order. Should we start, Ivy, if you're if you're up for, for leading off, and then and then Ratti, and then Ian at the end? Um, okay, I will try. Um, so I think for ASEAN, there are still there, there are some platforms that can be utilized, uh, such as the uh, ASEAN Regional Forum and East Asia Summit, where both US and China are part of. Uh, I, I obviously I think that you know maybe we can argue that uh, they, this two uh, avenue hasn't been uh, exactly very effective in the past. Uh, they have mostly been dealing with uh, very uh, non-sensitive issues. Uh, but I think that uh, the fact that both U.S. and China is still on board, uh, it it is still it is still an avenue that we should explore. Um, 
I, 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 I don't think that there is much prospect on what ASEAN can do in terms of facilitating a China-Taiwan uh, cross-strait uh, dialogue because, uh, as we know, that that has been that that has been almost not there has been non-existence for a couple of years now, and uh, uh, the 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 kind of a condition that China uh, has uh, given where. Taiwan has to uh, acknowledge the 1990 consensus essentially makes it sort of an impasse. Um, but I think that there is uh, that there is perhaps some roles that ASEAN can play in terms of facilitating some uh, dialogues between US and China, because uh, even between US and China, there is uh, there is no uh, effective uh, crisis management mechanism. Uh, as we know, China has uh, already cancelled the uh, defense dialogues with uh, the U.S. Uh, as part of the countermeasures of uh, Nancy Pelosi's uh, visit. Um, and yeah, like um, I think there's a report that says that uh, the help the the hotline was not picked up when U.S. was trying to dial into China during during the heightened tension over the a few days. So so I. I think that uh, there, there is uh, perhaps something that ASEAN can do is to first to encourage our party to encourage, establish some kind of uh, uh, talks or dialogues uh, as a start. And uh, perhaps uh, it might not completely solve the issue, obviously, but at least there is an additional avenues that uh, both great powers can talk. Thank you. Rati, do you have some thoughts? And you're on mute. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, thanks, Drew, for the questions and also the uh, participant for the questions. I think I I agree with Izzy that uh, I see that um, we can actually still utilize ASEAN, even though uh, ASEAN is perfectly imperfect for us. Um, uh, and also, I would like to um, uh, maybe to uh, build for the intermediaries one. Um, want to have track dialogue. So not only the uh, one uh, first track dialogue, but one and a half track dialogue between government and academics that might be work uh, for the confidence building measures as well between um, ASEAN and China or between ASEAN China, US, ASEAN China and the US because we have that sort of mechanism in our region, in ASEAN region uh, uh, of building um, uh, one health track dialogue between the academics and also between the officials of, of governments. Um, in terms of um, Indonesia, I, as I say, we will see during the G20 meeting whether um, Indonesia would be able to facilitate dialogue discussing Taiwan issues between um, the leader of the US and China during the meeting and Indonesia presidency uh, next year at the ASEAN. But I think Indonesia also has clearly mentioned that next year priority will be on Myanmar issues. So how then we put the agenda of Taiwan into the Indonesia, uh, Indonesia presidency that would be, uh, maybe we need to put some pressure to, uh, to, to the government in the region so that uh, we can push the agenda of Taiwan being discussed for Indonesia's next year's presidency. Um, I think Singapore, as we know that, I think Ian could also elaborate later on that Singapore has been hosting um, several meetings in 1992, Bangku Talks, and then C and Ma meeting in 2015. So I don't know uh, whether this would be uh, a good start for Singapore or for other ASEAN member countries to do the same thing in facilitating dialogue between Taiwan and China, or it could um, uh, but I believe Singapore could have more role in this view uh, in facilitating dialogue between Taiwan and China. Yeah. All right. Um, so I'd say first that um, anything that happens to Taiwan is going to affect um, ASEAN, right? So if you look at ASEAN stats, um, not just is Taiwan important, right? Um, Japan is a major investor in, in the region, much bigger than China. Um, and any trade that happens, and it's also a big trading partner, any trade that happens between Southeast Asia 
and uh, Japan, but also Korea, will be affected by instability uh, around the Taiwan Strait. So ASEAN, like it or not, um, is an interested party. Um, our various countries are, like it or not, interested parties. Um, so it, in that regard, I think it's important to keep the Taiwan issue um, in mind uh, in ASEAN, whether we can whether we can play some sort of um, uh, you know, middle role, I'm a lot less um, optimistic. I mean, given what's happened with uh, Myanmar, for instance, what ASEAN or perhaps Singapore could do is um, provide a venue for meeting uh, if that is uh, something that Taipei and Beijing would like to do. I mean, uh, we talk a lot about US-China relationship, the US-China relationship, but people in tai Taiwan they you know, vote for their leaders uh, and they are an actor. And so uh, what they want to do, what they don't want to do is equally important. Uh, and there's no way we can take away uh, that agency. So um, in that regard, um, I think um, what the baseline for what perhaps ASEAN and ASEAN member states should uh, do is to, I think, remind all parties that we probably don't want a uh, change to a unilateral change to the status quo that would involve force. I think that's the baseline. I think that involves everyone's interest and that should be articulated clearly. Um, whatever uh, Taiwan and China decide that they want to do, um, we can't really affect um, or for the US that, for that matter. But uh, we do have an interest in how uh, these um, uh, differences get sorted out. And that's important to stress. Um, I got several questions, of course, about Singapore's defense relationship with Taiwan. Um, the, official, um, the official position is that Singapore conducts unilateral military exercises in Taiwan, meaning to say that we borrow their space. Um, and there's um, a lot less discussion, um, a lot less clarity, at least from my vantage point, about any exchanges that go on, they may happen, they may not. I don't, uh, I don't have a particular knowledge uh, to, on that. Uh, so uh, that having said, been said, I think um, Singapore's military has historically um, had very close ties with the Taiwan military because uh, they were both anti-communist. And when uh, Singapore got its independence to start up its military, especially its Air Force and Navy, uh, because we operated similar equipment, there was um, a lot of, um, there was a, a degree of, uh, you know, take, uh, getting senior uh, instructors uh, from, from Taiwan over uh, to Singapore, uh, some who were um, ethnic Chinese from this part of the world who were in the ROC military, they served in senior positions here. Um, but that's, I think, something for the past. Uh, the, the relationship now, you know, doesn't have, have that air anymore. And especially since I think uh, it's, as Singapore has sort of moved to a position where, you know, even if you're ethnically Chinese, um, you know, that should be incidental to the fact that uh, you are fundamentally a Singaporean, a Singapore citizen, um, in first and foremost, right? So yeah, that, that's what I have to say. I'm happy to sort of uh, go on sort of and talk more if there's specific questions. Thank you, Ian, that was fantastic. Um, let me pose the next question to, to Rati and Ivy, and I'm, I'm scanning through a number of questions online that, that overlap a bit. And, and I think one of the themes that's being asked in a couple of questions uh, is basically, again, ASEAN focused, how, uh, and one of the questions comes from my colleague, uh, uh, Yong Wok Ru and at LKY School, but basically how do Southeast Asian states balance their national interests and maybe their natural, uh, their national diplomatic efforts bilaterally or multilaterally with an ASEAN effort? How, how does that two track uh, approach play out in the event of a conflict? Uh, so maybe Ian, open that one to you as well, uh, because I think that's that's kind of a, a key a key question in terms of ASEAN has a fairly broad one China policy, Singapore, Malaysia's, Indonesia's approach to, to their relationship with China. And of course, Taiwan is, is quite different. So how does that play out? How, how do you, how do these countries pursue bilateral actions and then still hold true and, and still hold faith with, with ASEAN and, and the notion of ASEAN centrality? Ian, Ian, do you wanna start? You're smiling. 
Was no, that that's, a sensitive question? That, that's a tough question, man. ASEAN centrality. Um, <laughs> it always gets a laugh. <laughs> yes. No. Well, it's it's tough because I think um, if you look at the ASEAN statement that was put out after the Pelosi visit, um, there wasn't even a mention of which strait it was. Right. There's Taiwan mentioned later on, but I mean, it said cross strait tensions. Are we talking about I don't know the Singapore Strait, the Malacca Strait, the Sunda Strait? Makasa Strait. Um, so I think uh, for ASEAN to sort of play on centrality, it's going to be cha challenging. But what it can do is to say, look, um, there is there are issues that I think all ASEAN members uh, that involve all ASEAN members when it comes to Taiwan. I, I mentioned this earlier. It's it's uh, stability, right? Uh, it's for tensions not to boil over. So in that regard, I think to have a common voice um, is is quite key. That and that's something that ASEAN can do. Um, bear in mind that it won't go unopposed. Uh, previous efforts to do this with regard to the South China Sea got a lot of pushback, and on some on some level, that's perhaps something that um, ASEAN members have to understand. Uh, we are not in the world of the late '90s or early 2000s, where everybody, all the actors in the region have a sort of fundamental interest in getting along, um, in you know, liberalizing th their economies. Uh, the US and China have a relationship where they're fundamentally interested in um, improving cooperation. Uh, and it was less, far less competitive. We're not in that world anymore. So any sort of effort to stake our interests, if it butts up against the interests of others, uh, and in particular, uh, the PRC with their wolf warrior mode. I mean, just yesterday they were talking about how they're gonna double down. China will be angry. Um, so we have to be able to account for that. Um, and there is also a lot of fear, of course, that Beijing will you know, put punishment, right? We've seen this with Korea, with Japan, with Norway, with Lithuania, the Czech Republic, um, Australia, and also, of course, Taiwan. Um, and that that's something that I think when we are pushing for our interests, we have to be prepared for um, and recognize that these difficulties are not insurmountable. Uh, so if you look at these cases that I've, I've mentioned, right, uh, there are, of course, there's an immediate shock. But like any unilateral effort to put economic pressure, these the effectiveness is somewhat um, uh, can be mitigated more easily, right? So in in this in this sense, I suppose when we think about how the security relationship works, uh, it should be what our interests are first and foremost, um, and that this doesn't have to go. This goes. This is consistent with our one China policies um, that we have official uh, relations with Beijing, not with Taipei, um, but that doesn't preclude um, other kinds of interactions with Taipei, and that we have our one China policies that are distinct, right, from that one China principle. Thank you, Ian. I'd note that that um, that August third foreign ministers communique uh, that that ASEAN put out. Um, uh, didn't mention the word Taiwan. It did say cross strait in the title, cross strait development. Uh, but the other thing it did do is acknowledge specifically that it reiterates uh, ASEAN members' support for their respective One China policies, acknowledging the difference. Before I turn to Ivy and and Rati, let me let me keep sort of adapting this this convert this question, but along the same theme. Um, uh, uh, Chi Dong Tao at East Asia Institute and Henrik Tung from RSIS have, have both sort of asked further questions. Uh, along the line of you know how a Taiwan contingency might divide ASEAN, or would it help unify ASEAN? Which I think is an interesting question. Could it actually unify ASEAN? Um, but but Henrik's question is, is is more of the lowest common denominator. What would happen if if Indonesia or Malaysia chose sides and chose China? What would that do to ASEAN um, centrality. So, so let me throw those two provocative questions out there and, and let you respond to them as, as, as you will. Uh, okay, I think I can start first. Um, in regard to the, uh, just commenting on the, um, the statement, August statement, the foreign minister statement, um, I think after um, ASEAN issued their collective statement, uh, each of the ASEAN member countries also issued their individual statements. And from that individual statement, you can actually uh, see which country that is, um, which country that are supporting China and which country are still in a, 
neutral position, I would say, or not choosing to take sides. It is very obvious that Cambodia and Myanmar mentioned that Taiwan is part of China. Okay, so uh, that, that, that's from Cambodia and Myanmar. Um, Indonesia, Indonesia clear, in, in its individual statement, Indonesia clearly mentioned the issue or the issue on the Taiwan Strait. So it acknowledged the strait in Taiwan, there's an issue there. Um, Singapore, I think Singapore state that uh, being a neutral position, but Singapore does not support Taiwan independence. So it means if Taiwan declared independence, then Singapore would not support it, would probably in the future. So you can see that different perspective, different points of view in understanding the, the one China policy issue. And yeah, um, what issue that might divide ASEAN, I believe if the conflict or the crisis over the Taiwan Strait spill over into the region um, involving the South China Sea disputes or for Indonesia spill over to the Natuna Seas, then we will see a divergence between the ASEAN member countries, no longer centrality there, uh, because uh, we believe that the maritime Southeast Asia would be against China action if uh, China's military use, of course, in the Taiwan Strait, if the issue is to build over into the region and the mainland Southeast Asia might probably support China's action as we can see from Cambodia and Myanmar has have mentioned that uh, Taiwan is part of China. Taiwan is part of uh, uh, Beijing territories. And um, I think uh, for Indonesia itself on how navigate between the uh, bilateral and multilateral issues to, to seek balance between, uh, between uh, this sort of um, block. Um, I think in, in, from my experience in 2015, the Indonesian government tried to wanted to expand its relation with Taiwan because they realized that uh, the growing importance of Taiwan for Indonesia in terms of economy, people-to-people -people connections between them. And then what the Indonesian government did at that time was um, uh, learning the practice the practice of uh, one China policy from other ASEAN member countries. So the, the government uh, conducted a sort of survey to other Southeast Asian country, particularly Singapore, that could have more advanced relation to Taiwan, but not risking the one China policy. So learning from Singapore, learning from Malaysia and Vietnam as well, then Indonesia uh, tried to expand it, ex expanded its relation with Taiwan uh, in 2015. So um, that's a good, a good, a good way of learning. Uh, among the ASEAN member countries, even though you do have different sort of views in understanding the one China policy, but each country could also learn that could build as an argument, okay, uh, it's okay to expand our relations with Taiwan, but because other countries did it as well. Like uh, Indonesia argued that at that time that, okay, Singapore can have a more advanced relation without risking its one China policy. And what can make ASEAN uh, unified? I think um, as long as China or as long as the conflict um, uh, do not uh, spill over into the region, I believe that ASEAN could maintain its centrality. And because uh, what uh, important for ASEAN member countries is keeping the status quo condition or situation. Um, if the status quo is changing, then we can see how this country would be divided in based on their national interest. Ivy, any thoughts? Um, okay, uh, I think that uh, Ian and Ratif have covered quite a lot of grounds. Uh, these are very uh, good and difficult to answer questions. Uh, but I mean, I guess uh, bilateral and multilateral effort doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. Uh, it should be. Uh, it should. It should. It should both. Both of them uh, equally important. Um, I, I. I'm also thinking that in terms of what Ratif say about whether that would divide and unite ASEAN. Um, I. I, I actually tend to think that uh, if it spill over, that maybe that might uh actually helps in uniting ASEAN. 
uh, or at least uh, the maritime states in Southeast Asia, uh, because then that is a sort of common uh, interest. And I think that that is perhaps uh, something that, uh, uh, if not all ASEAN, at least uh, a sort of military mini mini lateral arrangements among some of the maritime Southeast Asia states should uh, think about. Uh, if you are talking about a, a blockade situation, for example, in Taiwan, how would it impact uh, the shipping lanes in Southeast uh, South China Sea, uh, and uh, whether there would be any uh, any uh, sort of uh, uh, in attack or interruption? I think that's the point that uh, Ratif uh, mentioned in her paper. Uh, in the Malacca Straits, in the in the in the effort to sort of uh, stifle uh, China, uh, so so I think that there's some some are very big questions that uh, definitely is this is not even talking about uh, uh, whether to take a stand over that Taiwan or is part of China or not. I mean, I think that is just very purely self interested uh, uh, questions that we really need to think seriously about. Um, can I just quickly jump in on that? I think the efforts, uh, should there be a contingency to play up um, confusion and sort of divisions in our societies, um, that you know, we may not even be talking about questions of um, ASEAN unity, right? The unities of our very states um, could, could be called into question, right? But this is especially, I think, the case with uh, Malaysia and Singapore. Malaysia, I mean, I think Chinese are a minority, but they're a quarter of the population. Um, in Singapore, um, it's about 70%. So uh, you know you get enough of the cleavages going. Um, there, I mean, yes, there will be on the policy level paralysis, but our societies will have to pick up the pieces, uh, and that's I think a serious issue. That's very sobering. Um, let me shift tack a little bit, um, rather than delving too deeply into respective domestic issues, um, because sort of gears towards maybe some some recommendations, solutions, and some policy thought. Uh, nobody has, I mean, we've, we've talked about Taiwan a bit in the in the third person abstract sense, and we haven't really talked about Taiwan bilateral um, as, as, as an actor with agency um, and the difficulty of getting them to the table. But I'm, I'm, I'm interesting that nobody has mentioned uh, Taiwan's new look south policy, which uh, President Tsai Ing-wen inaugurated and sort of tried to reconstitute. And this is, um, I think, a strategy on Taiwan's part to, to decrease their dependence on, on China economically. Uh, we've mentioned earlier that the, the Taiwan business community in each of the countries is certainly a factor. Um, but maybe if I could get each of you to give me your impression of the, and you're both, you're, all three of you are very familiar with with Taiwan and Taiwan policymaking, maybe give me a sense of the new Look South policy, whether it's a factor or not, whether it's effective, whether it's working, but more importantly, what you think Taiwan could do differently from the perspective of, of uh, your respective country. Um, Rati, would you like to go first? Okay, no, okay, this is actually my own research, but <laughs> I don't. I, I don't know if I if my assessment will be correct regarding new southbound policy. Um, yes, um, it is. Uh, there's sort of a pattern of continuation as well from the past, uh, from the Li Tongfei until Tsai Ing Wen, about uh, the policy of looking to the south. Um, now they expand it to include Australia, New Zealand, and South Asia, India, for example. Um, whether, uh, but again. Um, the idea of new sovereign policy is mostly, I should agree with the idea of Taiwan soft power in this case, but then Taiwan is actually trying to how to convert this soft power become a sort of um, diplomatic support for Taiwan, uh, which we know it could be, it would be very difficult actually. So if we want to look at or to assess the new sovereign policy, um, I don't think if we expect some sort of diplomatic support from this policy would work. I don't think so that would be an effective one. But in order to promote Taiwan, to try to engage, to include Taiwan into the region, then yes, it might work for, uh, for this policy. 
uh, because of Taiwan's promotion of identity and democracy, um, it's actually influenced the um, uh, some countries in um, appreciating Taiwan's uh, unique or different uh, perspective from China or different identity from China, distinct identity from China. Uh, let's say Taiwan's aspiration for democracy, for um, for for the youth democracy, youth politics between Taiwan and Thailand, um, it was quite huge with the Taiwan uh, Thai Alliance, uh, Taiwan Alliance for Thai Democracy, for example, the transnational politics among the youth, it could work very well, and uh, between. Uh, uh, business people, of course, and of course, between education, social culture, some sort of soft power issue that would work. But if we expect some sort of diplomatic support or uh, whether the new Sahbon policy could facilitate a visit uh, like, like, Lee, uh, like Lee Tung Kui did in the past, that he could make a visit to uh, Southeast Asian countries, to a trip to a Southeast Asian country. I don't think so. That is the issue for now on because um, uh, the changing environment, the regional environment has been changing in Southeast Asia with the rise of China as well, getting uh, after 2000, China getting uh, more deeply engaged with countries in the region and Taiwan was losing its support after 2000. But then uh, it doesn't mean that Taiwan should stop this policy, you know, like Taiwan needs that. So. I believe uh, the Taiwan's uh, uh, foreign policy makers in Taipei, Taiwan's foreign policy makers in Taipei, they 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 have this sort of uh, division of work uh, when you talk about uh, U.S. and um, European country or Australia, for example. Then the issue or the value of democracy works better, works well. But then when it comes into countries such as Southeast Asia. Uh, I never see or rarely see that any direct support for democracy, either from Taiwan or from Southeast Asia itself to Taiwan's democracy, except on the civil society level, not from the governmental level. Okay, when we uh, when when um, there is a political crisis in Thailand and Myanmar, let's say Taiwan never ever touched upon the issue of democracy. What Taiwan cared was that their business, their investment in that two countries, okay? And then when when it comes into the cross trade conflict as well, never ever Southeast Asian country appreciate Taiwan's democracy. Even Taiwan was left out from Bali Democracy Forum, where the, 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 the biggest democratic forum in the region, Taiwan was left out. The um, beacon, of, uh, beacon of democracy in Asia was not invited into the forum. Apart, even for the civil society level as well, Taiwan was not invited into the Bali Democracy Forum civil society level. So, um, and Taiwan should accept this reality. And I think the policymakers in Taipei were good enough in navigating the relationship, what needs to be done in the Southeast Asia and then what needs to be done when it comes into the uh, relationship between uh, with, with, the, with US or with the European country or with Australia, for example. Ian, do you want to follow up with some thoughts on what Taiwan could do different or better for its new southbound policy? So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think the new southbound policy is a good idea. Taiwan is deeply integrated with uh, Southeast Asia, and there's no getting away from it just uh, from geography, but also in other respects, right? If you think about labor, um, they got a lot of labor from the Philippines, from Indonesia, um, and also in terms of their their external trade. So while Southeast Asia has not, um, you know, featured as prominently in Taiwan uh, politics before, I mean, a lot of the focus were on big players such as uh, Japan and, and the U.S. and then uh, sort of regional players like like Australia and so on, um, and also the EU. But the, on a practical basis, I think um, Southeast Asia is important. Um, and as Taiwan's demographic is changing, uh, as they there are more marriages with Vietnamese and Indonesians, uh, there has to be recognition that uh, the ties with with the region are very substantive, um, and th there has to be a, an effort to manage those sorts of relations. That's not, I think, something that Taiwan's public has fully come to embrace, but uh, something they should, and perhaps the New South Wales policy in the domestic facing part uh, should help um, educate Taiwan's population on. Now, on the outward facing bit, um, I think for, in, for Taiwan, it's complicated because um, on the one hand, 
Uh, it has these robust ties. Uh, that it needs to build on the civil society is a great area. There are lots of civil society issues such as labor, such as the environment uh, that need contact and discussion. But at the same time, um, because of the wariness that various regional governments have to, uh, towards the PRC, uh, there is a real reluctance to put a lot of these ties on the table, which is fine. And I think a lot of the seemingly um, quietness, seeming quietness of the new South bond policy has uh, is due to the fact that governments don't want to advertise um, this, these relationships, lest they get they get Beijing all angry all over again. So uh, I think on on that front, uh, the new Southbound policy can emphasize more the uh, civil society aspects, uh, especially on common issues such as labor, uh, the environment, uh, cultural contact, especially in ways that go beyond the ethnic Chinese communities, um, and to also emphasize that uh, Taiwan too has a strong um, uh, Austronesian element, right? A lot of the indigenous people share um, cultural roots uh, with, with the region that can be emphasized more. I think um, the other, the other thing that the New South Bound policy should, I mean, is important, but it's a bit, and Rati touched on this, um, but I think it's tricky for Taiwan, is that for Indonesia, um, Taiwan can stress that it's a democracy. Indonesia is a vibrant and consolidating democracy. Um, not all of us in Southeast Asia, all, not all of us in Southeast Asia are. And I think some of the way that uh, Taiwan has been portrayed in Singapore's uh, mainstream media, for instance, is about how messy their democracy is, about how dysfunctional it is, because I think it doesn't fit the narrative that vibrant democracy that Taiwan is doesn't fit the narrative or the interests of um, you know, power holders in Singapore. So Taiwan has, these are all complications that Taiwan has to navigate. So what that means is that even with successes that Taiwan has, um, it's, it's very hard for them to advertise them. Um, but they sh that sh should be, that should not be a reason that Taiwan uh, stops pushing. The new South Taiwan policy I think is important. And I think to stress that Taiwan is a stabilizing uh, factor in the region, because there is a a continuing view that uh, Taiwan behaves like it did during the Chen Shui years as a so-called troublemaker. Um, but I think that's very different from where Taiwan is now. Uh, but a lot of sort of regional views of Taiwan has not been updated. Uh, Taiwan, I think, uh, is a stabilizing force and that should be known. Thank you, Ian. I think um, Adrian Ong, my colleague at RSIS here in Singapore is, is basically asking the question you've just answered, which is, you know, how does how does uh, ideology and the the democracy autocracy binary affect uh, calculations here? And it sounds like uh, it, it's it, it's it's the notion of quiet pragmatism being welcomed. Uh, Ian, I also I, I love the mental image you're giving me of the legislative yuan with their fistfight antics, and well, they're not really fistfights; they're really more kind of hold me back wrestling matches and the occasional pig awful on the floor. Uh, and then that's not happened as much recently. That's been a lot of the 90s, but that whole yeah. image continues. Yeah, no, the last good one was the uh, the, the pork ractopamine debate when, when some opposition lawmakers brought brought pig guts in, into the legislature to spill on the floor. And, and of course, trying to compare that to, to Singapore's parliament, uh, I, I can see the natural contrast um, so let me let me turn to Ivy some some thoughts on the southbound policy. Uh, uh, actually, I, I've learned a lot here. This is not just economics. It's not just uh, people to people ties. It's uh, it, it, it's pretty broad. So so what do you think Taiwan could do to be more effective uh, by enhancing that relationship with Malaysia or more broadly, if you'd like to comment? Yeah, I think that. Um... New Southbound policy has uh, unfortunately lost some of its momentum com now compared to when it first started in 2016. And I think there are a couple of factors, there's a sort of two-way factors uh, uh, for that. Uh, I think one would be that the kind of uh, challenges that uh, Taiwan is facing uh, in terms of uh, what it wants to achieve in Southeast Asia, in, in New Southbound countries, uh, and what is uh, realistically achievable uh, given the sort of uh, con the geopolitical uh, environment. Um, so, you know, like when it first started, they, they, they had very ambitious goals, like it was meant to sort of help Taiwan to reduce uh, reliance uh, 
away from China and sh by shifting some of the investment to uh, Southeast Asia. And then there's also uh, this uh, ambition that uh, Taiwan would be more regionally integrated uh, into the region's uh, uh, you know, economic uh, deals and everything. Uh, and we know that this uh, not has not been possible for Taiwan uh, because of resistance from China. And then I think that the, the, the on the other hand, there's also uh, the factor, the fact that uh, there has been a lot more opportunities opened up for Taiwan uh, in terms of the kind of uh, increased strategic importance that uh, it has gained uh, from policymakers in the US, as well as uh, some of the European countries that has been uh, a lot more explicit in terms of uh, supporting uh, the Taiwan cause. Um, so, so I think, uh, going forward, there is, uh, I think that uh, the Taiwanese policymakers has to be uh, clear of uh, what it wants to achieve in uh, New South Wales countries, uh, specifically in Southeast Asia. Uh, I think that uh, it is possible, it's, it's probably not uh, possible for, uh, to expect uh, Southeast uh, Asian countries to have very explicit support towards uh, Taiwan. Uh, but I think that there's a lot more that Taiwan can do in terms of uh, telling the Taiwanese story. Uh, as uh, Ian mentioned just now, the, the Chinese uh, influence operation is quite pervasive in uh, Southeast Asia. And I think that uh, there is uh, one area that uh, Taiwan should probably look at. And I think that, um, to a certain extent, there are populations that are in Southeast Asia or at least in Malaysia that are sympathized uh, to, to the sort of uh, situation that Taiwanese find themselves in with regards to uh, China. Uh, and I think the comparison of sort of a uh, the, the asymmetry between uh, Taiwan and China also sort of uh, uh, resonate uh, to a certain level uh, with the people in Southeast Asia and Malaysia. Right. Can I add that there's some things that Taiwan does really well. So with disinformation, with influence operations, they've not gotten rid of it, obviously, but they managed to reduce the severity, at least for now. Uh, so mm -hmm. those are things, those are skills that they, they can probably um, appeal to to others with and I think at the other uh, on the other level it's uh, economically um, it's useful for all countries I think to be able to um, have enough diversity uh, to in, in terms of just good risk management may you may trade some media growth with that uh, so Taiwan investing in the region I think uh, apart from the obvious economic benefit there's the also diver risk diversification element uh, that can, that can be talked about um, and also sort of investment in Taiwan. I mean, quietly, Korea and Japan are um, diversifying their risk. Taiwan's doing the same thing. And I think for uh, countries in Southeast Asia, that may be something we need to consider too, because as we look at China's economy and also their economic policy, uh, they may not be, they may be moving from, away from the direction that we have been previously used to with this sort of high growth uh, model that, that they used to put out. Rati, do you have a follow-up thought? Um, just one thing that I believe that the uh, presence of the um, Southeast Asian communities in Taiwan uh, through the migrant workers and students also help Taiwan to sort of um, confirm or uh, to the uh, international standard, uh, human rights standards or uh, uh, liberal international order standard. And that actually um, helped to uh, rape support from the US as well. Like say, um, Taiwan is now listed as the uh, uh, listed as the most friendly Muslim uh, countries for traveling, and that was actually if you know the story of uh, Muslim in in Taiwan. Let's say they have been there for quite some time, even even since the move, uh, um, even since nineteen forty nine after uh, Chiang Kai Shek uh, moved from. Um, Beijing uh, from, from mainland to, to Taipei. But then the issue of Muslim population in Taiwan were just gaining uh, uh, acknowledgement and more popular after Tsai Ing-wen. Even though Ma ying has proposed the idea of making Taiwan as a Muslim friendly uh, uh, countries, but then it become uh, 
another um, boosting under the Tsai ing -wan. And that was actually gaining support from the US um, um, State Department of uh, acknowledging Taiwan as part of the Muslim friendly countries. And that would actually make Taiwan, eventually made Taiwan become so-called uh, a vibrant democracy by acknowledging uh, the values of Muslim compared to China, which which what we look from uh, Xinjiang and Uyghur case, for example, that makes Taiwan distinct uh, from um, from China, and that was the soft power of new soft power policy that I think uh, boosts uh, the Taiwan's democratic value in that sense. That's fascinating to think about. You know, Taiwan is a multi-ethnic, multi-racial. Uh, multi-religious society draws it closer to Southeast Asia than it does to the mainland intentionally or otherwise. We we have about five minutes left before uh, we'll let you go. We we do have one question from uh, Professor Farid uh, Ramadani, who I believe is from Indonesia. Um, and, and he asks a question about, you know, low-hanging fruit that, that may be plucked. Um, and, and it's a good question. Like, what's what's something that ASEAN could do to, um, to to address some of the issues we were talking about? And and I had a thought that I'll throw out and, and just take a moment or two to to, to give me a response. Uh, but my, my thought would be, when I've done research and I've come fairly late to Southeast Asia in my career, I've spent more time in Taiwan. But as I've been researching a little bit more about you know the importance of Taiwan to Southeast Asia, I find it's difficult to collect data. ASEAN economic data is actually very, very well collated, very well collected, but there's no Taiwan column. You, it's very hard to see what ASEAN and ASEAN state trade with China, with Taiwan is because it's not disaggregated or it's just plain not available. Um, and I also find it hard in some cases to, to collect trade data in Taiwan itself for, for various reasons. And it's not language, it's uh, a whole other issue. So my, my question is, do you think it's feasible or do you think it would be advisable for ASEAN as an organization or Southeast Asian states themselves to start publicizing more about the extent of their uh, trade, tourism, investment, people to people ties, statistics and links, official government, uh, government data. So maybe I'll, I'll let you all respond to that potential recommendation and then, and then uh, any final wrap up thoughts we have. Uh, Ian, do you want to? Sure, sure. Um, so absolutely, I think um, there's a lot of reluctance to publicize uh, data on Taiwan, largely because of sensitivity about China. And that, I think, is spilling over into a lot of self-censorship. That is unnecessary. Um, I mean, if you look at Taiwan being an APEC and all, there's no, and also, you know, other sort of bodies, there's no reason to, to sort of obscure or high Taiwan data. Um, so I think on the, on the side of Southeast Asia, this is just data, right? So there's no reason why we can't, I mean, there's, there's data on Hong Kong. So um, I think there's certainly no reason to sort of put, um, to sort of hide what Taiwan is doing. And if Beijing is upset about it, I mean, that also is a signal about how reasonable they are to sort of very standard kinds of practices. Um, I think on the other hand, uh, Taiwan needs to improve its own sort of data uh, transparency with regard to, to Southeast Asia and the way that they organize the data, right? So um, we, you know, there's not that much information on the sort of diversity that Taiwan's population is becoming, the diverse plural, they can have more data on that. Um, with regard to trade um, and investment stuff, uh, there's this sort of odd column that uh, Taiwan data has about um, 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 permit, permitted or approved approved um, ethnic Chinese investment and all that, which I think is a holdover from, um, you know, uh, back, back in the day when, you know, you know, Chiang Kai-shek was still around, uh, that needs to be updated to sort of fit into the sort of more standard accounting practice. Otherwise, it a lot of these flows are difficult to see. So I agree, it's, it's low-hanging fruit. Um, there's not much attention to it, and there's too much self-censorship that can be overcome. Rati, any thoughts? Oh, about the um, data management. I think um, it's, it's hard. I, myself, you... Not 
I think we lost your we lost your. Yeah, voice. I can't I can't hear you either. Why don't Why don't we go to to Ivy? Ivy, um, if you want to weigh in, then we'll come back to Rati. You want to check your mic? Um, I think on the question of uh, data collection, uh, I agree uh, with Ian. It is a unnecessary uh, self censorship. So I actually don't think it's that sensitive at all, and it should be done. Uh, I'll, I'll just in the interest of time, maybe I'll just go into a bit of a wrap up. Uh, so I think that uh, with regards to what Malaysia should do and what Southeast Asia should do, I think there's a couple of things, right? I mean, I think, first of all, I think that is the, the uh, need to preserve our self-interest, our core interest. Uh, and I think that 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 in, in that regard, I think that we should be preparing for contingency. We should think more about how our ASEAN uh, member states can work together or with uh, regional powers, including Japan, Australia, uh, to uh, to actually uh, preserve our interest in South China Sea. Uh, I think that perhaps in that uh, regards, uh, ADMM, uh, ADMM Plus can play some roles in that regards. Uh, and then secondly, I think that uh, we also need to uh, build resilience. Uh, it's not just security, but also resilience to our economy and supply chain, right? And then I think secondly, apart from our preserving our self-interest, I think the second one would be to actually uh, project some of our influence to prevent the crisis, because I still think that conflict is not inevitable. And I think that it's important to remember that uh, even though we might not be able to resolve the crisis. I mean, let's be realistic. No one is actually expecting Southeast Asia to resolve the crisis. Uh, but uh, by lending voice, it actually strengthened the uh, international support uh, on the issue. And it can actually act as a deterrence for a uh, possible reunification uh, over Taiwan. And then finally, I think on ASEAN, uh, sorry if I sound like a broken record, but I really do think that uh, ASEAN have a role to play. And I think that uh, I just want to like flip it a little bit to say that uh, it's actually also in ASEAN interest to be more proactive because uh, ASEAN needs to do that in order to stay relevant as a regional architecture. And I think that we have some soul searching to do uh, with regards to uh, the kind of role we want to play on issues like on the Taiwan Straits issue. Thank you, Ivy. Rati, is, is your mic working? Can we, you want to get some final thoughts in and then we'll yes. wrap up? Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, now it's working. <laughs> so I'm assisting from the earphone to not using the earphone. Um, yeah, uh, regarding the publication or data, I think as I said that um, um, it's basically most on using Taiwan's data. And one thing that I would like to uh, propose is that I think um, lack of academic discussion and engagement between Taiwan and Southeast Asia also influenced the outcome of the publication about Taiwan in Southeast Asia. Unlike the US or the uh, European country, they set up or um, Taiwan sort of academic association, but we don't have those sort, sort of as association, academic um, association between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. So that is one thing that the Taiwanese government might and the Southeast Asian government or academics might work to uh, create such a platform or association in order that we can talk about Taiwan and uh, and in that case that we can actually generate the data uh, that are set from between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. And in regard to the uh, conflict itself, I um, I believe that the ASEAN member countries or Indonesia itself were uh, seeking to uh, keep the status quo position because it's beneficial for um, for every parties, not only for ASEAN and Taiwan, but also for the US and China. But then um, I would again stress that it would really depend on the um, the efforts or action taken by the US, China, and Taiwan itself. And please don't uh, let Taiwan um, uh, left Taiwan outside the table. We need to bring Taiwan into the table, no matter how and what. But then, uh, uh, how to do, to achieve it? We we still need to bring Taiwan's voice um, into into the discussion or dialogue between uh, to to resolve the conflict. Because if we don't bring Taiwan, it's not um, it's it wouldn't be too effective because um, uh, we wouldn't uh, um, wouldn't be too effective, and it will be just zero sum. So, in, if as Indonesia now proposing a new paradigm, three new paradigms, I hope that Indonesia could um, 
uh, consider that the Indonesian government could consider on how bringing Taiwan issue into the table without risking the one China policy itself. And I think I believe Indonesia could do that and other South Asian countries could also do that. Thank you. So Rati, Ivy, Ian, I really would like to thank you very much for joining us on our fourth Counterpoint Asia webinar. Uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, and I'd also like to thank our participants online for joining and submitting excellent questions that really helped inform our discussion. So please be on the lookout in a couple of days. Uh, we'll send, we will publish uh, their essays uh, and commentary and link back to the permanent uh, site for, uh, for this webinar. And please tune in in November for our next edition. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you.